Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Hi. <laughs> My name is Dr. Roger Narlock, and I'm director of the Benedictine Institute of St. John's University. Thank you for joining us for this talk as part of our two-day series of events aimed at exploring Benedictine perspectives on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Please note that all of these talks will be available on Digital Commons and on the Benedictine Institute webpage um, of the or website of the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University website. Uh, be sure to also join us for the other presentations in the series. We have uh, uh, wonderful talks going on uh, tonight from 7 to 8, tomorrow afternoon from 4 to 5, and both of those are in the same room. And then we have a panel discussion among all of the uh, speakers uh, led by a discussant uh, tomorrow night in the Stephen B. Humphrey Auditorium from 7 to 8.30. Uh, everybody is welcome to join in any or all of those events. There may be no more important issue in our nation today than promoting and supporting issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. This series of talks is aimed at exploring what an explicitly Benedictine perspective on DEIJ issues could look like. I ask you to join me in welcoming Cindy Liliana Gonzalez as our first speaker in this series. Cindy, uh, a College of St. Benedict alumna, also earned a master's degree in ministry from St. John's. She currently teaches family ministry in Spanish and English as part of the Emmaus Institute with the Catholic Diocese of St. Cloud, Minnesota. Cindy is currently finishing a second master's degree in education at the University of Minnesota, focusing on parent and family education. Cindy identifies herself as Chicana, having grown up in Los Angeles, California, and spending the summers of her youth with her maternal aunts in Tijuana, Mexico. Cindy currently lives in Los Angeles with her husband and son. She will speak today, uh, today with us about the topic, Navigating Spiritual Bypass When Talking About Oppression, Leaning Into Benedictine Values. Uh, be sure to note that there will be time for Q&A afterwards, so be sure to note your questions throughout the talk. Please join me in welcoming Cindy Liliana Gonzalez. Hi everyone. In the spirit of transparency, I would like to recognize my privilege to be standing here today while also holding true the many obstacles that I continue to navigate in this work as a woman of color. Being able to hold space for a conversation that I value in my personal life, in the classrooms that I get to teach, and in the many communities I get to walk with is a privilege that I don't take for granted especially because my parents paid the highest price to now see me freely read, think, and teach for a living. That price being the ability to dream. To physically, mentally, and spiritually silence one's dreams for the sake of basic survival is oppression, especially when such basic survival is constantly put into question rather than upheld as a fundamental human right. Also, I am not a monastic, and I am not an oblate, as a Chicana woman holding a conversation today on Benedict and spirituality gives me a sense of a little imposter syndrome, especially because most discussions and scholarship on this topic is done so by people outside of my intersectionality. Yet here I am. I went through formation within these Benedictine institutions, both as an undergraduate student and then again as a graduate student. And during my time here, I inherited an ancient tradition with ancient practices. And as we all know about culture, it is kept alive only when it remains open to new options, open to ongoing change, when it encourages inclusion. I use the word inherit because of its ongoing yet often mysterious worth in my many vocations. In the purest of forms, the most powerful conversation, meaning that it was full of human emotion, it did not fall trapped to the oppressive construct that showing emotion is weak, that I have ever attended happened within these institutions. 
The conversation was led by award-winning Hmong American writer Kao Kalia Yang, author of the memoir, The Late Homecomer. She openly wept without apologizing as she recalled traumatic familial memories and at one point naming the physical toll such a conversation took on her, on her family, on her body, on her life. But she stood in front of that room and through tears spoke a message that invited the room to listen. I wish I could say that since then I have attended many more conversations with similar spirit, but they are not so easily found. They require vulnerability, authenticity, transparency, and actively making the connection that what we do for work can be spiritual if we recognize it as such. I heard an invitation to listen during Kalkalia Yang's conversation, an inspirational invitation that left me wanting to speak more honestly, inclusive of welcoming the emotions that come when speaking, listening, reading, and experiencing oppression. But also in that moment, I began to wonder why it was out of the norm to openly experience emotion in an academic setting, especially one with an embedded spirituality that invites us to listen with the ear of our heart. When we talk about oppression, it gets uncomfortable really fast because such a conversation is also inclusive of the important conversation that is power and privilege. When we don't have these conversations in a parallel manner, they have the potential to make real experiences an unexplainable occurrence. If we leave a conversation on oppression, power, and privilege with the belief that these experiences are unexplainable occurrences, we then step back into our communities with the potential to cause harm, not just to our communities, but to ourselves as well. Yet, even if we have these conversations in a parallel manner with the latest of DAIJ resources, the potential to cause harm remains if such conversations leave attendees to individually navigate their own emotions alone. Why? To put it simply, it's because no one wants to feel uncomfortable. We want to feel comfortable, especially now during these times of continued humanitarian crises that we're witnessing in the comfort of our own homes sometimes across our world. But what happens when we don't make room for the emotions that come from exploring the complex concept that is oppression? What happens after someone's vulnerability, authenticity, transparency, leaves us with an invitation to feel uncomfortable, yet we choose to seek immediate comfort? And the last question, what happens to us when we live a life of continued oppression? When we as individuals attempt to rapidly silence or dissolve the emotions within ourselves that come from learning about oppression, here it's essential to note that such emotions include disbelief, rage, hopelessness, grief, exhaustion, anxiety, fear, hostility, contempt, many, many more emotions, right? We are practicing spiritual bypass. When we as educators attempt to tightly control our emotions for the sake of being a neutral facilitator, when teaching about oppression, we are practicing spiritual bypass. And when we continue to convince ourselves that our oppression is a gift from God, we are practicing spiritual bypass. Now, spiritual bypass is a term coined by the late psychotherapist and author John Wellwood. The term, according to Wellwood, is using spiritual ideas, words, and or practices to avoid or evade the personal and emotional work or to depreciate our basic needs, feelings, psychological wounds, and or developmental tasks. During spiritual bypass, we promote a sense of detachment for a sense of stability. For example, when listening to someone speak about experiencing oppression, a person leaning into spiritual bypass may respond, I will pray it away for you, from us, from you, from me, or God would never give us, me, you, something you, me, we couldn't survive. These responses often come from a place of desiring so bad to give someone comfort. Yet such responses are often only offering a false sense of comfort, 
often causing more harm than good. I will be the first to admit that spiritual bypass can be very alluring, especially as an initial coping mechanism, because it is deceivingly cozy in there. It convinces us that we can substitute developmental tasks with physical things, like a weighted blanket. It can also have the pervasive power to chronically convince us and an entire population that if we just have maybe one more drink, we'll feel better. The stakes tend to get higher when spiritual bypass is prolonged. Cultural responsiveness, humility, competence, whatever way you name it in your work, it has many names now, is a developmental task. It is work. It is ongoing. It is a commitment to truthfully live as we remain open to transformation. This journey has no set destination, but rooted in a shared sense of mission, of actively uplifting the dignity of all human persons. If we want to encourage ourselves, our communities, not to spiral into prolonged spiritual bypass that is often practiced for a false sense of stability, especially when talking about complex topics such as oppression, we need to be able to recognize and practice real stability. To recognize the word is a verb. It's to be able to define and identify someone or something from having encountered it before, to know it again. So then what is real stability and how do we practice it? In my work and studies with parent and families, stability can sometimes be limited in definition to constructs that, I, that allow for predictability for a child to thrive. For example, a child feels most secure when having a consistent place to sleep every night. Stability is a very important topic in parent and family education because it informs parents that predictability can help foster a nurturing relational bond between parent and child. Now stability within the spiritual should not be limited to a definition of predictability. What do I mean by that? We sometimes hear about these institutions as never changing, so stable, so predictable, I've even heard it be described as an escape, an oasis of some sort, almost utopian. Patrick Henry, author of Benedictine Options, explores stability as not utopian, meaning that we don't know what the community would look like when it reaches its goal. He writes, Benedictine life is experimental all the way to the end. Furthermore, he writes, while the outsider the monastery might seem the embodiment of a controlled environment. It is, in fact, an uncommonly spontaneous place. This idea of these institutions being experimental is inspiring because it invites us to live in the spirit of the moment, especially when learning, teaching, and participating in community living. If we live in the spirit of the moment, we make room for the practice of spirituality. We make room to live intentionally. We stop limiting stability as predictability, but as believing that we become who we are by our relationships with others. In the book, Radical Hospitality, The Way of Benedict's Love by Daniel Holman and Lonnie Collins, we read, genuine spirituality is not cozy and seldom makes you comfortable. It challenges, it disturbs, it unsettles, it leaves you feeling like someone is at the center of your existence on a major remodeling mission. Look at that, we're back to the limitations of cozy, not being so great. We recognize stability and hospitality when we share, regardless of our position of power, our own grapplings with the journey of multicultural humility rather than try to hide them or by remaining neutral. Choosing to not practice and to not participate in conversations of how we grapple with our emotions on this journey as educators, as monastics, as advisors, as librarians, as students, will help others enter the space of spiritual bypass. For that will be what we recognize as stability. 
Hospitality is not just welcoming other as Christ, but also making space for what challenges us, for what disturbs us in and outside of the classroom. Such making space, Daniel Holman and Lonnie Collins Pratt express as what actually is spirituality. Our work as students and educators is an invitation to spirituality, one we don't have to accept, but one that can help us make sense of who we are now and who we want to become, especially in the midst of continuous cultural turmoil. Personally, the biggest harm we can cause in an educational setting is leaving students, and here I use students to include all of us on this journey, to fend for ourselves during spiritual bypass. We do that when we don't note that spiritual bypass is not an anomaly, but rather very common and active in our societies, within ourselves, within the community. When we fend for ourselves, we forget the part of living in community is actually seeking counsel. Seeking counsel to continue having dialogue around what is to be done about the grief that many face from a lack of inclusion, while at the very same time, that same place is called an oasis by some. So this duality. Because of my intersectionality, I think of DEIJ as a form of spiritual practice. Here's why. Within the scope of oppression, you may ask yourself, as Paulo Freire does in his first chapter of Pedagogy of the Oppressed, is humanization a viable possibility? Freire expresses that while both humanization and dehumanization are real alternatives, only the first is the people's vocation. His answer is yes, while at the same time not negating the realities of the oppressed. I'll pause here to ask the very important question, what is dehumanization? Adam Waits of Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern, author of The Power of Human, defines dehumanization as neglecting another person's mind. This definition reopens the door to the core of my conversation here today. To neglect another person's mind is to marginalize them as incapable of having complex emotions, thoughts, critiques, and are having important conversations on this being human. In other words, deeming them worthless, sometimes even before you even have the opportunity to meet them. In the words of Freire, you are stealing a person's humanity in the moment you are mentally, physically, and or verbally throwing them away. Let's weave in curriculum here of oppression. When we teach about oppression, are we using materials that are from a strengths-based perspective? This meaning that humans are seen as having power and wisdom rather than being labeled solely as at risk, right? A strengths-based approach allows for people to have been, that have been historically underrepresented to see themselves represented at their best for the sake of seeing their own value and their own dignity. But it calls for formal and informal supportive networks for both the student and the educator. The educator is called to engage in ongoing reflection for the sake of not causing such community any further harm. A student who is equipped with educators that are culturally responsive, recognize and prioritize their dignity. They are humanizing education. As Bell Hooks explores in Teaching to Transgress, education as the practice of freedom. When education is the practice of freedom, students are not the only ones who are asked to share, to confess, Engaged pedagogy does not seek simply to empower students. Any classroom that employs a holistic model of learning, meaning the union of the mind, the body and spirit, will also be a place where teachers grow and are empowered by the process. That empowerment cannot happen if we refuse to be vulnerable while at the same time encouraging students to take the risks alone. Professors who expect students to share confidential narratives, but who themselves are unwilling to share, are exercising power in a manner that can be coercive. And again, these are the words of Bell Hooks, not my own. But what is not strengths-based when we talk about oppression? The example here being for if we're engaging in a poverty simulation, where we all pretend to be poor for an hour to potentially generate empathy. 
Freire calls this false sense of empathy a lack of true connection, lovelessness. Lovelessness, according to Freire, is what lies at the heart of the oppressor's violence. It is lovelessness even when clothed in false generosity, he calls it. Meaning that a poverty simulation may encourage us to donate a few dollars to a charity that is seeking to feed the hungry, but that money may be coming out of a place of temporarily feeling uncomfortable, but not love. What is a strengths-based example? Within poverty, extended networks of care exist. Teaches the reader that others have something to teach us and how communities show up for one another when in poverty. Rather than how I, as an individual, can go out and save the world from poverty. So the mindset shifts. If we want to get more specific here, ingenuity can be found in poverty as well. That ingenuity often gets ignored or looked down upon when met with the savior gaze, the lens. Now, according to Marianne Adams and Jimena Suniga, co-authors of Getting Started, Core Concepts of Social Justice Education, the following questions are the issues that we as facilitators face when talking about complex concepts like oppression and power and privilege. Where do we start? Question number one. Question number two, how do we build an inclusive learning community? Three, how do we bring participants' social identities and social positions into focus? Four, how to work with expression of emotions and challenges posed by complex ideas? And five, how to balance focusing on specific identities with acknowledging and exploring intersections? Great questions to ponder, academically speaking, facilitator speaking, very important. To be pondered in community and transparently. But also given the intersection identity here as Benedictine, by tradition, by culture, these questions cease to be solely academic, but they turn into spiritual questions. When we answer these questions as Bell Hooks invites us, we must remember the need for union in mind, body, and spirit, all for the sake of uplifting a humanizing approach to education. Now, the Benedictine values are posted across many pockets of these institutions. Inside the classrooms, common spaces, event spaces, offices, we know them. We can recall them. Sometimes we can name them. We cite them in our work. We may use them to describe some, to someone what exactly are these institutions and why are they so special. Some of us may even look at them and wonder, are they really present here? If so, why am I not experiencing them at this moment, especially during moments of lack of inclusion? I like to think of these values as our common thread. It is what unites us. Although these institutions are indeed Catholic, that does not mean everyone here is Catholic. These values are special because they serve as our foundational basis of where to start when we are engaging in dialogue. They are meant to be embodied rather than to be thought of as, as things that just happen naturally, randomly. They are a way, but they're not the sole way. It's a way where we can begin to humanize education. When we choose to embody these values, we are practicing spirituality. And when we practice spirituality, we are participating in keeping a culture alive. We practice these values here when we are students. We reflect on them, we wrestle with them, we question them, we look for them. But they don't stay here. We take them with us on our next stop, on our every stop. I'll conclude this portion of the conversation today with an anecdote. Now, throughout my entire childhood, my parents worked in various factories across Southern California. Some of those factories put profit above physical safety. And they paid such low wages that it chronically kept them absent from our family for the sake of basic survival. Such an example is not an isolated incident. It binds me with so many people with a similar intersectionality. My parents were often made to feel like they were invisible and replaceable in their places of work. 
Their main parenting goal was to remind me and my four siblings that we see and we receive people for who they are, human. Humans are not invisible. The Benedictine tradition complements their teachings, hence my deep appreciation and recogni recognition within these values, within the spirituality, that we welcome the stranger as Christ. We are entrusted to co-work to make these spaces more hospitable. And such work is ongoing. We don't know what the end result will be like once we continue to practice radical hospitality. But we do know the consequences now of bypassing and settling for a false sense of stability. Right at the beginning of this, I talked a little bit about what I inherited, and one of them being ancient practices I mentioned. And that ancient practice that I use in the classroom, as you heard in my introduction, I teach in the Emmaus Institute, predominantly Spanish-speaking um, members of the community in rural Minnesota that have a desire to be a deacon or have a desire to be a minister. Historically, that hasn't always been available to them. And when I talk about these ancient spiritual practices, I recognize Visio Divina. His Traditionally, we use that practice with images of the St. John's Bible, right? We look at the image, we hear a passage in the Bible, and we note a word or a phrase that does something to us internally, or we see something in the image that we then connect to our auto historias, to ourself, to our own stories. Now, that's not always inclusive to use, especially now that I'm at the University of Minnesota about to leave. Not always appropriate to use St. John's images, right? So then I thought, well, this practice still works. This process still works. How can I use it in a more inclusive way? So then I use um, images from famous children's illustrated picture books in where I read to parents with sometimes older adults that got never read to as a child. So we look at these images with characters that look like us, that sound like us, that use same terminology as us to say something, um, to describe something, a feeling, to play the same games that they might have played as children. So they see these images and we practice um, Physio Divina and something happens, right? Some of the same things that happen when we use um, biblical images in the Bible. But in this case, we make it a more inclusive opportunity to be able to recognize that not everyone is comfortable with biblical images. That's one of the examples that I've used. And within that, when we practice Visio Divina, it is said that the more, the merrier, right? Because the more that we have practicing, the distinct, diverse experiences come through when we describe what we hear and how we connect it to our own stories. What happens if we continue to do the same practice with the same group of people? We sometimes miss out of what somebody else is also seeing within that same image. Thank you. Anyone have a question or a comment? Yes, Jesse. That's uh, sitting with so much of your talk. Uh, towards the beginning, when you talked about cultural responsiveness as a developmental task, mm -hmm. that was um, a really interesting idea to think about, especially on a college campus. And um, the, the hope would be that this DEIJ work is being done preschool through uh, at, at each stage of development, right? But how, how would you approach um, cultural responsiveness, and particularly with college students here on Benedictine campus, um, if they haven't had some of the like, earlier developmental work in that regard? Yeah. Um... 
when I'm in my program at the U, we learn all about the milestones that we look for in a child, right? Um, are they speaking? Are they using a tool, a spoon, a fork? And it, as parents were, or a caregivers are like, okay, yes, yes, yes. Doctors, yes, yes. Uh, they're meeting these milestones, right? Um, but in terms of this being a developmental task that is a lifelong experience, sometimes we start way later in life. And when we don't have a tool to measure, or we do, but we don't feel comfortable being measured in that regard, it can get really complicated really fast. Um, I, and like I said a little bit, it's, it's it makes it even more complicated when we're kind of asked to fend for ourselves after with all the emotions that happen or we silence them. And it's so interesting because as a parent, you know, we, you get taught to emotionally regulate with the child who's having a tantrum or whatever it is and you regulate. If I get hurt um, on a bike accident, for example, I have to emotionally regulate myself to not traumatize my child, right? And, and I have a hard time with that sometimes because it's like, am I allowed to show him that I'm in pain right now or I'm not? And it gets really complicated with that. But when we're adults and we're meeting other adults on the same developmental journey, and we're not doing that, we're emotionally regulating ourselves. It's almost like a self form of oppression. We're telling ourselves, no, I'm not allowed to feel um, angry or I'm not allowed to feel really sad right now. And some of those feelings are actual visceral reactions when you're part of a conversation that makes you want to leave the room and maybe even like physically be ill, right? So I think about, um, just the different ways so many people are already starting very young, but also holding truth that bias exists within, within that sometimes too. I, as you know, I live in California. There's this bias that we have it all figured out. We don't. We don't have it figured out. Um, and as a parent, you see that sometimes when your kid comes home with a colonial hat with a feather of a Native American tribe that it was not even real. Right, and having to navigate that reality at the same time. So, yes, as a developmental thing that should be started, and I think some parents have already started, right, from a very young age to start talking about some of these things, regardless of where geographically you are, regardless of if your school has diversity or not, right? I hope I answered some part of your question. Thank you for this talk. I'm wondering, and I don't know if this connects, but I'm wondering about um, resistance hmm. as an emotion and resistance to critical race theory, diversity, equity, inclusion. Is resistance um, a way of spiritual bypass, or what? What? How would you think about that through our values? Yeah, I think. I think initial resistance to any type of change is what we, we want to stay in a position where we feel uberly confident, right? In our wheelhouse, this is where I feel most confident. This is where I know my stuff. And um, when we meet resistance, oftentimes it's our developmental task of being like, well, I don't want to be a novice uh, in, within something new. This is really tricky. I don't want to feel that small. If we were already made to feel small, to begin with within our own wheelhouse, right? We had to like jump through the hoops to get to where we are now. Why would I start all over again? So also just recognizing that some of the DEIJ needs to come from out of a place that's it's not um, humiliating, right? On both accounts. Um, and then also in terms of resistance, resistance is interesting because then you have to acknowledge, for example, as a person of color, acknowledge my own power in a situation, right? So what might be perceived as resistance on my part to even engage in a conversation that I know I'm gonna lose because of my lack of power in a situation, I, then I, it becomes a spiritual dilemma. Am I being resistant to this conversation because I know I'm gonna lose? Is it an ego thing or is it because I'm scared, right? So recognizing the range of emotions that come with resistance. Is it about the self? What is it about the self that makes me resistant to something, to change, any type of change, right? Even my little kid resisting to go to a, from a non-pedal bike 
to a two-wheel bike. He's five years old on the non-pedal bike, and then finally one day hopping on, be like, I know how to do this. I didn't even have to, but it just takes that initial first step to feel uncomfortable. But I think that's the beautiful thing, though, about Benedictine spirituality, right? That the, the idea that the novice and the older monk kind of hold each other in, in terms of teaching one another and listening to one another and what I can learn from the novice and the novice can learn. It's the sustainable model, right, of making sure that I can learn from someone who's different from me, who's younger than me, who's older than me, um, who speaks in a different accent. I can learn from them, right? It's not dehumanizing them is what's important. Thanks, Barbara. Yes. Um, thank you, Cindy. That was really incredible. Um, you know, I'm really captivated by the idea of spiritual bypass. Um, and, you know, it appears the answer you offer at the end are certain questions that we should answer in community. But I'm left a little bit kind of asking, you know, what's next? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think spiritual bypass is where a lot of us um, start from. You know, if I'm suffering, God is suffering with me. Uh, in Cold Spring overnight, 20% of the employees of a poultry uh, factory get laid off because of supply chain shock. You know, God is suffering with me. In St. Cloud, my mom is dying of cancer. And instead of getting my mom therapy, St. Cloud Hospital is saying, you need to start a GoFundMe campaign. Mm -hmm. Or the students, you know, here on campus who every year organize, um, and I agree with your analysis in terms of the challenge of it, but who organize sleeping outdoors in cardboard boxes overnight to raise awareness about homelessness. Um, it seems for most of us, spiritual bypass is where we start. Mm -hmm. And so I think even though those questions are really profound, um, I guess I'm left asking, um, you know, as all of us experience and challenge of oppression, after the bypass, what's next, if that's where we start? Yeah, yeah, and that is where we start. And like I said, I'm the first to admit it's really cozy in there to begin with, right? Um, and oftentimes, it's not just one time that you feel oppressed. It's oftentimes, especially even if we're not talking about oppression, if I'm a novice, I'm made to feel le if I'm made to feel less than constantly when I'm entering a, some sort of educational function, right? Um, that is where we start. Can we stay there forever? Yeah, I think we can. I, I've seen it in entire communities. Um, my own like cultural background sometimes um, where we're made to stay there sometimes um, when we're not given the opportunity to see our oppression in a different light, when we're made to chronically become reliant on something else for the sake of silencing what was never asked of me. How are you feeling right now in the midst of your grief? Is that what it's called, right? Is that what I'm experiencing? Because I thought I was just angry, right? So I, I think that just the opportunity to encounter someone who's willing to listen, to see you for who you are, where you are, um, is important. And then if I'm not in that position, if I'm the one encountering someone else, am I prepared to be hospitable or am I just trying to push you away so that I can get to my own? Um, destination. So yeah, I think that is where we start within spiritual bypass, but it's, it starts to feel uncomfortable within that space. You're, I don't think that you stay in that space and you're made to feel comfortable chronically. I think it starts to not feel good when it stops working, what was working before, like the weighted blanket stops working suddenly, or um, all of a sudden it's way too much alcohol consumption and it's causing other areas of my life to be um, not well. And sometimes it takes that seeking counsel of someone acknowledging, I'm noticing this, are you okay? Can I help? Right? No. Thanks for your question. Can you say, you talked about bringing uh, a strength-based um, approach to uh, the classroom and the education Say, can you say a little bit more about some of those ways that you've done that in your, yeah. own, your own teaching? Yeah, so I currently teach at the Emmaus Institute and um, 
traditionally I speak in Spanish with my students and a lot of them work in, across various different jobs in, in rural Minnesota. Some of them at the turkey factory, um, Jenny O, right, that's nearby here, and, and they openly talk about some of the things that they're experiencing in their work. Um, and it almost comes off as, I deserve this, some of these things that I'm encountering um, because of whatever other things underlying guilt, shame, or I'm made to chronically feel this way at work. Um, and then the strengths-based approach comes in and just saying, you're more, right? Let's talk about that. You're here and you're bringing so much into this space right now. Um, you have this vocational calling that maybe you've been bypassing for so long because thinking there's no way. No one's even asked me if I can work in a different capacity. I, I just assumed that this was it for me, right? Um, so thinking about the strength space approach of saying, no, you have a lot to offer and let's get to the bottom of what that is for you. And um, that has proven to be very good, but also hard um, to ask someone uh, to, how are you doing? And them kind of being shocked. No one ever asks me that, right? Um, do I have feelings? I've had students saying, I, I have no feelings. I have no emotions. I don't know what to, what to even say right now. I'd be like, well, maybe we just silenced them for too long, right? So the strengths-based approach to just stepping into that classroom and also using materials that spotlight them in, at their best selves with dignity as good parents, right? Uh, because we want to be good parents because a lot of my students are parents as participants in rural dioceses, um, as graduates of a formation program that are about to be deacons in this rural community, right? Who started off somewhere completely different, thinking there's no way I could ever be a leader within this space um, because I don't speak English, because I don't do this, because I don't look this way. And then, yeah, them being the examples of I am a strength, I am an asset to this community, yeah. I just had an aha moment for you, so I must say that loud, right? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so part of it, sometimes we, you're talking about oppression, that it's an ethnic thing that just, you know, people of color are oppressed. When I'm thinking about church ministry, mm -hmm. and I think about um, lay people in your maze program, not just the Latinos, mm -hmm. but all people, and often women, uh, do a lot of spiritual bypassing. I'm just having this connection about their own vocation in their own call because they think it belongs to someone else. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering about that spiritual bypassing in uh, non-ethnic situations for people. Yeah, you know? yeah I, I, over the weekend, um, we were talking about how far we've come, the students were talking about how far we've come from our machismo grandparents that basically told us we have to withhold domestic violence, we had to stay married in, in marriages that were very harmful to entire generations, right? Historical trauma, generational trauma. And we've come so far, we've, we're done with machismo, we're, we don't even know what that is anymore, right? And then asking the question, well, within the church setting, does anyone here have a woman as a spiritual director, right? And everybody's like, no, is that a thing? Yeah, right, it is, it is a thing, right? Or, or, but at the same time, holding space for somebody asking me, can I be an oblate or do I have to only speak English? And if I don't do that, but can I still be one? Or, and then as an educator asking, yeah, I don't, that's a really good question, right? But sometimes we don't see, um, but at the same time, how do we hold that oppressive construct within ourselves, right? Am I capable? Do I seek what I'm capable of from someone else who looks different than me? Because I think that people like me are not capable in these vocations, right? So asking that, that internal check too of, wait, am I also doing the same thing to other people, right? Um, and especially in, in Catholic ministry, I have plenty of colleagues who enter spaces hospice including and being met with, oh, 
no, I was seeking somebody who's Catholic. And it's like, well, I just stepped into this room. What do, what do you mean? Is it because I'm a woman? What, what does that mean, right? Um, yeah, right. Underlying of gender, too, in these spaces. Yes. Um, what did you, so when you told your story about how you uh, sort of first experienced the uh, breaking spirit to bypass with, mm. the, with the speaker who was weeping yeah. openly. I mean, I took that as, as uh, a signal that one of the ways that we can we can start uh, undermining spirit to bypass is by providing, especially those of us who may be teaching or speaking, mm. to allow that to to show to be an example of somebody who does express those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that though? as, for example, a teacher or speaker with not wanting to use your position of authority in that context to sort of imply that others ought to follow along with your story mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to seeing you as an example of somebody who's willing to share their story. Yeah. I'm trying to like differentiate the questions on here, but yeah, I think that Culturally speaking, we're used to what we're used to, right? If someone begins to weep during a conversation, sometimes they're like, ah, what do I, do you need a tissue? Can you stop this? Like, it's almost like, can we stop? How can we fix this right now? Um, we're trying to play the game of like, who's gonna help her stop crying as fast as possible? Um, and again, apologizing, that happens all the time in when I'm in Zoom meetings with all across the different roles that I'm in of somebody apologize, I'm sorry, I'm, got, I'm getting emotional, I, I need to step away, right? And it's almost like a level of discomfort of I don't want you to see me this way because it'll make me seem weak. Um, and it's frustrating, right? Because if we don't allow for that to happen to a certain extent, it becomes out of norm rather than normal that humans have emotions and that they, they happen sometimes. They come out without us um, wanting to. But some of us have gotten very good at keeping it right here, right? Of like, I'm not gonna cry, but I'll start grinding my teeth or um, I'll step away and just think of something happy. But sometimes I do get in instances where one of my professors at the University of Minnesota calls it one mic, one diva. One person at a time needs to talk, but then sometimes what happens when someone completely takes over an entire conversation that may not belong to them, or thank you for sharing something really difficult. How do we appropriately move on from this when you're openly weeping right now because we have to make space for somebody else here? That's the hardest part, I think. Um, to acknowledge someone's dignity and emotions. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and they want to continue talking sometimes, right? And it's like, how can we move to someone else in this space? Um, well, at the same time, if I'm sharing something of my emotion within the classroom and saying, this is a narrative, not the narrative, right? So, because I'm sharing as a Chicana woman um, from LA, doesn't mean other Chicana women from LA have the exact same intersectionality. Because that is where we get, when we get in trouble, right? We're like, oh, I, I've met someone like you before. Did you also grow up in poverty and your parents worked in factories? And then we're like, absolutely not, right? And what? Who told you this about me, right? So also just making sure that we're very conscious about this is my story um, within this developmental task but my colleagues might be very different from mine because of the obstacles that they face as a, as a woman, as not a woman, as a Catholic, as a non-Catholic, it, it differs. I think that's what makes this developmental task so tricky is that we want to see community, seek counsel, but everyone's on a different level and a different aspect of this journey, yet still important to, again, the novice and the older generation linking together during this time because we both have time and space to learn from one another. So I hope that answered. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. 
Um, I heard you mention grief a number of times mm -hmm. while you were talking, and it made me think about um, like the connection of types of emotion that maybe elicit bypassing. Do you find that um, are there like a particular set of emo like types of emotion that elicit this behavior more often, or is it also like can traditionally good emotions like happiness or joy like does that yeah. also include bypassing? I think um, when we talk about oppression, I could I could speak for myself, right? When I talk about oppression and oppression that I've felt, um, it's easy for me now to say um, I acknowledge that there's joy in reflecting on some of those things that I've gone through, that my parents have gone through historically. Um, but before that, there was a lot of anger, especially because it was continuous and I kept facing it and I didn't know how to navigate, right? I, it was just like, okay, maybe I'm supposed to just not say anything or worst of all, leave the entire situation completely to avoid it, right? Oh, well, it's not working, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm stepping away, I'm stepping away. But that's what sometimes people like me do. We leave the entire conversation. We burn out fast, right, in spaces where we're made to feel like, to question our own oppression, like maybe this is all made up in my head, right? Maybe it's not really this. Um, Maybe this is an obstacle I'm supposed to face, a gift from God. Maybe this is not, trying to teach me something. But then we get into the bigger conversation is, did God recreate oppression, right? And, or is this a man-made construct that I'm facing right now, or a woman-made, a human-made construct? Um, so I think about that you can still experience a sense of grief within joy. So joy is um, being able to recognize that I felt grief, right? And, yet I'm not there right now, but it's still so fresh. And the thing about the cycle of grief is that you can be out and then you can be back in two weeks later, starting again, right? So yeah, just thinking about, can we be joy in spiritual bypass? Maybe for one thing, but then we experience that same oppression again. Do we remain in a state of joy or do we go back to that feeling of anger, um, wanting to bypass it like this again? Can I remain in a state of joy? I'm not sure. I, I think it depends on who's there for us, right, um, in that moment, and who helped us navigate it the first time around. Can they be there for us again and recognize that this wasn't my fault, right? I'm experiencing something. I'm naming it for what it is. Can you be there for me to listen, right? All right, thank you so much. A few more quick thank yous. Uh, thank all of you for taking a little time out of your out of your afternoon this Monday. Um, thank you to Trissa Schaefer, the uh, administrative assistant for the Benedictine Institute, who has done so much organization around this. Um, and I welcome all of you to continue to attend the other sessions. Our next one is 7 p.m. in this room. One of the things that was very intentional about our title for this series is it's called Benedictine Perspectives on DEIJ. And we, we thought we don't want one person to come up and sort of give what is what becomes like the way to think about it from a Benedictine perspective. Uh, so that's why we have three different people talking about it from their particular lens. And we are off to a wonderful start. So thank you so much, Cindy. <laughs>